If you love what you hear, check out our authors Andrea Stewart and N.A. Fulton on Amazon.com, and be sure to subscribe to our Dark Romance Novels and Stories podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast provider. Learn more about us at audioion.com. Love great stories well told? Visit audioion.com to find the best in audio fiction. Chapter 21. That little martinet told me your brother died. Is it true? Norfolk trailed after Corwin, poking plants with his walking stick as they milled around the garden. I do not know, said Corwin. She felt bone-weary and sick to her stomach. So, it appears I am now marrying an heiress with no entanglements, said Norfolk. Really? Who? Corwin inquired. You my dear. I need not fear your brother will sail to your rescue and die for your honor. Of course, with your rather dubious history you are still no prize. Nevertheless, I find myself pleased. Do you not have anything better to do than torment me? Corwin lumbered around to face him. I have no intention of marrying you. I would rather hang. Now there is an intriguing alternative, said Henry, pausing as if to consider the thought. Unfortunately, I am afraid that is quite impossible. In a few weeks we will be married. Your estates will be sold and we will live in London. I am afraid we must break the news to my mother gently that I have made such a bad match. But I'm sure within the year you will conceive and that will please her very much. Corwin turned back toward the house. She had no idea why he tortured her. She had no doubt that it served some deeper purpose than merely amusing him. She just could not imagine what it was. She holds you quite responsible for my recent brush with death. He said as he followed her up the gravel drive. Which is quite sensible since your lover almost killed me. Nevertheless, she will come to accept you as my wife, and you can spend the rest of your days proving to her that you love me. Corwin felt the first pain convulse her body as she stepped through the front door. It started at the top of her thighs and radiated up into her like a knife. She gasped and clutched at the door handle. When the pain subsided, she found Henry watching her. Well, I suppose I will find that little housekeeper and send her to you on my way out. It seems you are about to deliver yet another unwelcome child into a world already filled with them. I will drop by in exactly one week so we can discuss how you will become Lady Norfolk. Then he was gone, striding toward the kitchens as if he owned her house already. Matty appeared shortly after Norfolk's departure. With agitated efficiency she helped Corwin up the stairs, holding her steady when a contraction doubled her over. Once upstairs she helped Corwin undress and slipped a loose linen gown over her head. Corwin gasped as she endured the next contraction. Matty, having summoned maids to strip the bed down to its sheets patted her on the shoulder. How long will this go on? I should think the child will come with the dawn. Surely I cannot bear this for so long. A fine strong lass like yourself? Thee must not be a whimpering. Tis labor they call it, and labor it is. But when the babe is in thy arms thee will never recall the pain that brought him here. Corwin took a deep breath as she felt the next pain start and forced herself to keep breathing deeply as it washed over her. Matty smiled. Aye, that's the way of it. Some say tis easier to stay on thy feet as long as thee can stand. At that point the midwife arrived and Matty bustled away. Against all the woman's protestations, Matty forced her to wash her hands with strong lye soap and boiled water, and to change into freshly laundered clothing and a new apron. Neat as a pin she'll be. Me own ma were a midwife and she would always say the devil lives in dirt. Over time the pains came faster and lasted longer. Corwin eventually found herself holding onto the bedpost as they rippled through her. After her water broke, they came harder and faster until she could not stand. Matty helped her onto the bed and put her back against the headboard. When the first urge to push came Corwin was surprised. Even more startling was that pushing provided respite from the pain. As Matty had predicted it was just after dawn when Corwin held her son in her arms. He had black hair and steel grey eyes. His hand curled around her finger when she touched his palm. As she put her child to her breast for the first time, her heart ached for Devon Black. Where was he now? Could he not have learned to love this child? 
What chance could her son have with nothing but a mother to protect him from Lord Norfolk? Why, for the love of God, had that man not died? Nearly a week after her son's birth, Corwin sat in the library before a blazing fire. Rain lashed the windows and a rising wind blew the branches of the trees outside to and fro. Having lived a lifetime in Cornwall, Corwin recognized the signs of a gale blowing up and prayed for any ships that might be off the coast. This kind of weather often caused shipwrecks and on more than one occasion she had watched vessels dashed to pieces off the rocks near Land's End. Any ships that had not made port already were in for a very rough night. They would not sail into any of the harbors for fear they would be blown into a breakwater or onto the shoals, and they could not stay in the channel for fear of capsizing in the rough waves and furious winds. In her hand she held a letter from Norfolk. He said he would arrive in the morning and he warned her to be prepared to marry him. Corwin watched her baby sleep and wondered how she might rid herself of Norfolk once and for all. She pulled her feet up under her dressing gown and rested her head on her knees. One thing was certain, she was through trying to appease him. Devon Black examined the fallen tree that blocked the road in front of him. Under normal circumstances he would have driven around such an obstruction, but the ground on either side of the road was a mire of mud and water several feet deep and chances were good that the old car would sink up to its axles if he left the path. Are you sure this is the right way? Devon asked Chase for the third time in the last hour. Pray God the man did not die a few furlongs from home. Another two miles down this road, Ben said. He shivered uncontrollably even though he was wrapped in several layers of oilskin. Devon jumped down from the seat. He moved to unhitch the horse from the wagon. Has it occurred to you that you have extremely bad luck? He called back to Ben. It seems like something unfortunate is always happening to you. That is not true. I met you did I not? Chase laughed a little until a cough took over and left him gasping for breath. Yes and now I have bad luck too. Can you ride? We do not have a saddle. Of course I can ride, said Ben sliding to the edge of the cart. I am not an invalid. Devon moved the ancient animal closer to make mounting easier. That is good to hear because I doubt this horse can carry you the entire two miles and you will have to walk the final bit alone. Once Ben was astride the horse, Black picked up the flickering lamp that provided the only source of illumination on this wretched night. Surely you will not turn back tonight. You must stay with us a few days. I want a chance to thank you properly. If I tell Corwin to trust you, she will. I will explain all you have told me and she will believe me. Devon winced. It had been hard to come up with the host of lies required to answer Ben's questions in the last weeks. He had been sure, in fact, that Ben would see through them. He had claimed to be buying rum from Lucas when he heard about an English man being executed. Being English he had stepped in to save him. Ben seemed to entirely have forgotten Corwin's state of undress on the night Norfolk was killed. How else to explain his acceptance of Black's story that Norfolk had tricked them into what looked like a compromising situation? All in all it was a pack of lies that only a man who had hung on the brink of death for weeks would believe. No, no. I can feel the rope around my neck already. I will get you within sight of home and then I will head back to my ship. Devon led the horse around the tree and in the process found himself up to his knees in mud. It took him fifteen minutes to struggle back onto the gravel only to find Chase slipping off the horse again. He caught him in time to prevent a fall and shook him awake. If I can slog about in this mud, you can manage to stay on the horse. Do you hear me? Ben mumbled something Devon had to take as agreement, and they set off once more. The road was slick and the horse lost its footing with some regularity. Each time the horse stumbled, Ben would pitch forward, then start to slide off. So it was with some relief that Devon saw the windows of a manor house ahead. Is that it? He asked. Ben stirred, lifted his head slowly and peered through the darkness and rain. I do not know. It is so dark. You can make the rest of the journey alone, can you not? Devon tried to put more conviction into his words than he felt. I think so. Said Ben. I am just a little dizzy. And then he fell off the horse into the mud. Devon sighed. He heaved Chase over his shoulder and made for the lights. The damned horse would have to fend for itself. It was painfully obvious that Ben was falling prey to the fever that had plagued him on and off throughout the voyage and there was no point trying to convince either of them otherwise. The sooner he got the man out of the rain, the better off they would both be. When Devon finally stood on the wide porch, his back felt like it would break. He prayed Corwin was asleep, or in London, or anywhere other than answering a stranger's knock on her front door in the middle of the night. It really wasn't too much to ask. He would simply deposit her brother with some humble servant and then he would disappear. 
Mustering his courage, he pounded on the door loud enough to be heard over the storm. In just a few seconds, the door fell open and he felt as if he were looking into the sun. Corwin was in a dressing gown with lace at the neck and wrists. Her eyes were dark pools and her face was as white as a sheet. He tried to say something but she drew away from the door as if the devil himself stood there. He followed her into the house. He wanted to explain, to banish her fear. But he found himself mute. What could he say? After a moment, he remembered why he had traveled so far. With great care, he turned and let Ben slip from his shoulder to fall with his back against the door so he sat on the floor. Devon saw Corwin's eyes fly to Ben's face, then back to his. Without a word, she fainted. When Corwin awoke she was in her bedroom and she could hear Matty ordering men about in the hall. She sat up in bed, eyes flickering around the room until they found what they were searching for. Devon Black sat in one of the armchairs before the hearth, his child a bundle of white in his arms. Father and son stared at one another as though she had never existed, a picture of perfect harmony in the dying light of the fire. Devon, Corwin could not quite believe her eyes. Is this my son? He asked, without looking at her. Corwin nodded, though Devon wasn't looking at her. To think I might never have seen him. You brought Ben home. I stumbled across him and thought you might like to have him back. I do not know how to thank you. Please do not. To be honest, he may not survive the night, and if he does he will never be the man he was. He is very ill, and he has been badly abused over a period of months. You must not be shocked when you see him. Corwin sat in silence for a moment. In the morning Lord Norfolk would arrive. He would find Ben alive, and would discover who had brought him here. He would also learn that her child had been born. Quite suddenly Norfolk's determination to remain at her side made sense. It was not for lust that he hung about, rather a desire for revenge. He had expected Devon to return for her. You must leave right away she announced. No. Devon did not look up. You are going to take your child and leave my house tonight. You are never going to come back. Corwin heard herself say the words and felt the emptiness in her chest that went with them. I do not understand. He looked around. I do not want you near me and I do not want the baby. I do not want either of you in my house. Get out. Once they were out of the house, safely away from Norfolk and his twisted scheme, she could rest easy. In fact, now that she had seen Devon with his son, she knew the child would be safe, would grow up loved and happy, and, she could dispose of Norfolk herself. Of course she would hang because she was about to kill him in cold blood, but that seemed a reasonable trade. It was better than living without her son and without Devon, surviving in a loveless marriage with a man that hated her. In fact, she doubted that Norfolk would let her live long after Devon was dead. He hated them both so much. I cannot believe what I am hearing. Devon's face was tight, his eyes like black pits in the dark room. Get out of my house. Corwin felt her heart breaking as she spoke. It was all so clear. Devon stood up, his child in his arms. You are a most unnatural woman. Get out. She heard him leave the room, heard his footsteps in the hall. She fell back onto the bed, heart pounding with uncertainty. She could run to him, could catch him, could beg him to take him with her. But what of Ben? Norfolk was still alive, still determined to punish her. If she were gone, who would Norfolk punish in her stead? She heard the front door open and close. It was over. They were safely out in the clear night left by the rain. It was a few short miles to Penzance, where Devon could surely find a wet nurse, then onto his ship where he would be outside Norfolk's reach. She studied the firelight flickering on the ceiling. After a time she found she did not feel like crying or running after them anymore. Her chest felt hollow, her mind felt vacant but the fear she had lived with for so long was finally gone. It was strange how her problems had been solved so swiftly and unexpectedly. Where is thy Ben? Matty was shaking her. Had she fallen asleep? She had watched the dawn fill the sky in an idle search for peace. Then, just as she had finally decided to rise and dress for the day, she must have drifted off. Where is thy child? Matty was shouting at her, panic evident. With his father? Corwin struggled to sit up and found that her breasts were sore. What? Matty took her by the shoulders and shook her hard. What evil hast thou done? I sent him away with his father. It was my decision. He sent thy baby away with a pirate? Devon loved him. I could see that. Corwin felt anger stir. She had been through so much in the last weeks, and now Matty was attacking her. Well, she would not stand for it. Get out of my room. Matty slapped her hard across the face. I curse the day I ever saw thee. Better he had never been born. 
Thou art nothing more than a cruel, wicked, and thoughtless chit. She strode from the room. Corwin sat in the drawing room at the appointed hour. She had loaded a pair of Ben's pistols and they hid in the folds of her dress. She held a book, but instead of reading it, she watched the fire flicker. Where was Devon? The sky was overcast no more rain had come. He must have reached his ship by now. What would her son think of her when he grew up? She had held him for such a short time, he would never remember her. He would think that she did not love him. She heard a rap at the door, and a moment later Matty ushered Norfolk into the room. Thy friend, milady, she said, then she disappeared, leaving the door wide open. So, you are safely delivered. Where is your son? Norfolk looked about the room as if expecting to see the child in some corner. I sent him away as you instructed. I did not instruct you to send him away. I said we would find a place for him. Norfolk's voice rose sharply. I have already found a place for him, said Corwin. He is with his father. Then, feeling as if she were in a dream, Corwin carefully put her book to one side and shifted her skirts to grasp the guns. She saw Norfolk's expression fade from rage to shock as she raised both to point at him. What are you playing at? What do you imagine will happen to you if you kill me? Have a care Norfolk. I assure you such considerations do not matter to her. She will pull the trigger. Corwin heard Devon's voice and she turned to find him standing in the open door. He was dressed as he had been last night, in a lawn shirt, dark breeches and muddy boots. But this time his rapier was drawn. As she saw Henry turn toward him, saw Henry's hands move toward his own blade, she pulled trigger on the weapon in her right hand. In the small room the resulting explosion made her ears ring. She opened her eyes a moment later to find the bullet had gone wild. Norfolk was at the door and Black had his blade to the man's throat. Corwin squinted and leveled the second pistol. Devon put himself between Norfolk and the gun. Stop my lady. There is a better way. Corwin slowly lowered her weapon. Then Devon turned his attention to Norfolk. So here we are. You have wanted me for a long time and now you have me. I wonder what I shall do with you. If you murder me, then you, the girl and her brother will all hang. You mean, if I murder you, you will be dead and that is not at all part of your plan. Black smiled. So, let us settle our differences like gentlemen. He took a step back. Where do we find gentlemen settle our disputes these days? I believe it is at the Oaks just outside London, isn't it? Norfolk straightened, his relief evident. I see. We will meet there in a week. You will see me there in three days. We will leave now, and we will ride together, eat together, sleep together until I can kill you before witnesses like the gentleman I am supposed to be. Lord Black, this is none of your affair. Ben stood in the hall, dressed haphazardly and with a face as white as a sheet. Corwin is my sister and it is I who will meet Norfolk on the field of honor. No, said Corwin. She raised the second pistol again. Corwin, please put the gun down. Devon did not deign to look at her. The situation is well in hand, he continued. With respect, Lord Chase, you are in no condition to fight a duel with Lord Norfolk. He is said to be a very competent swordsman. As you are now he will kill you. You may serve as my second if you wish. I cannot let you do this. Ben teetered put his hand on the door frame to balance himself. Your sister has just borne my child. What? What are you talking about? When all is said and done I think you will find you want to kill me far more than you want to kill Henry. Under the circumstances, I suggest you take on the loser. Ben looked stricken, but managed to reply. As you wish, Lord Black. So, Henry, are you up to defending yourself? Can't you just see us standing there, toe to toe, cold steel singing for blood? That is what you live for, is it not? It is not often you get a man like me who can give you a run for your money. Black turned to Corwin. His eyes softened at her disheveled state. I was halfway to Penzance when I realized you would only part from your child to save his life. I decided to be the man you always thought I should be. So we will leave within the hour. Matty already has you packed and our son, having rejected his nurse, is desperate for you. She held out her pistol and he moved forward to take it. Why did you not let me kill him? Because, my dear. If he died in this house, with you your brother and I all in attendance, we really would be hanged. He must be killed with all of London watching. True to Black's word they left for London in under an hour. Black and Norfolk shared a coach driven by Adam and flanked by Aubrey and other members of Black's crew. Corwin, Ben, Matty and the baby shared another coach. Holding her son in her arms again, Corwin could not control her tears. His hands clutched at her breasts as she fed him, and his eyes were wide and frightened as he searched her face. How could she have sent him away? And yet in three days' time if Black lost this engagement, her brother would die and the child would have to part from her yet again. The cruelty was unimaginable. 
she would never marry Lord Norfolk. Instead she would surely hang for killing him if Black and her brother failed. She would end his madness whatever it cost her. Pirate's Desire by Andrea Stewart. Voice recording copyright 2020 by Nancy Fulton. All rights reserved. Music by Alexander Schweif licensed from Pond5. Visit audioand.com to find the best in audio fiction.